Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh, wait, no, that's a spoiler about about what we're gonna talk about today. Um and now you can't see my face. Okay. I can figure this out. I can handle it. Hi. Welcome to uh Physics University. I'm Maggie. And I'm wearing my fun fetty sweater. So yesterday, not yesterday, I'm like, wow. Time just doesn't make any sense here. Um, last time I streamed, I talked about this paper that went through quantum field theory working with gravity and relativity and it was weird and not great. But it got me thinking about another like pop science topic that I think is really fun. And that, whew, excuse me, I just woke up from a nap because I was apparently really tired. Um, But a pop science topic or just kind of a fun science topic uh, of negative mass. I I think it's fun. I think it's silly. It's not real. And it's not something that... Like, it's not actionable. You'll hear, hear people talk about, like, warp drives and negative mass. And, like... It's not useful. There's nothing useful that can come out of this, at least not right now. Um, but it's fun to, particularly in the context of, of last week, like it is fun to look at existing models and then try and push those models, like take them to these wild. And so I wanted to talk about negative mass a little bit. And, um, so yeah, let's go talk about negative mass. And if I'm ever talking about something that you don't want to talk about, just tell me in the chat and we'll talk about it. To, oh no, by a black hole or something. Okay, so I'm gonna just sit up here in the corner and we can talk about negative mass. So I just have the Wikipedia page pulled up. Um, Wikipedia is a great place to start for a lot of... I can. It's a pretty good place to start if you are interested in a physics topic. It's usually pretty dense and hard to parse sometimes. Um, and other times it is not good enough, but Wikipedia is fantastic in that it has citations. So we'll probably look at a couple of these citations and read through actual papers. Anyway, so negative mass is Negative mass is mass with a negative sign. So I'll just read the opening paragraph and then we can talk a little bit about it. So in theoretical physics, negative mass is a type of exotic matter whose mass is the opposite sign of normal matter. So like a negative kilogram. Such matter would violate one or more energy conditions and show some strange properties. Stemming from the ambiguity as to whether attraction should refer to the force or the oppositely oriented acceleration for negative mass. Uh, it is used in speculative hypothetical technologies such as time travel to the past, construction of artificial wormholes, um, Alcubierre drive, 
and other types of warp drives. Currently, the closest known real representative of exotic matter is a region of negative pressure density produced by the Casimir effect. Okay, so this idea is that we got mass and we got negative mass. I'm pretty sure that this idea is stemming from but the idea to explore this is stemming from uh, how electromagnetism works. So in in E and M, you have an electric charge, and that charge can be either positive or negative. You have two charges, and like charges repel each other. Similar charges attract each other. Oh, sorry, similar charges. Yes. Sorry, similar charges repel each other. Opposite charges attract each other. And these charges create a potential landscape upon which other charges interact. If I have two point charges, they're either going to attract each other or repel each other based on their sign. And point charges the electric field and the electric force that they produce are inverse square laws. Um, they go like one over R for potential and one over R squared for force. And this is the exact same mathematical uh, function that describes gravitation too. So you can have a gravitational point charge or like a planet. We treat them like point masses. And the sun exerts a one over R squared force. I wish I had my pen tablet. I'll get it in a minute. Um, so the, the equations for electric forces and the equations for gravitational forces are very, very similar. The way that they talk about potential, the way that um, an electric landscape is constructed versus a, potential, a gravitational potential landscape is constructed. They're almost identical in every single way. Except there is only positive mass. I don't have negative mass and so I don't have there's only attraction there's only attractive forces in gravity matter wants to be next to other matter just like positive charges want to be like be next to negative charges they're attracted mass is attracted to mass and we don't have negative mass We've never seen it. Is that because it doesn't exist? Or is it because if it's the opposite of attractive, it's repulsive, that it's just been pushed out to the edges of our universe and we can't find it anymore? So, so this missing analog, this... I've got positive and negative charges, and I can describe those really well with mathematics. I have just positive mass. What would happen if I introduced a different charge of mass? I introduced the, the idea of a negative mass, a repulsive mass, instead of an attractive one. What does that do? And this is something that's been thought about enough that there's an entire Wikipedia page on it. So... In cosmology, cosmology being the formation of the universe and the, like cosmic universe history. So it seems like pretty recently there was an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford who proposed dark fluid theory related to notions of gravitationally repulsive negative masses presented earlier by Einstein that may help better understand in a testable manner the considerable amounts of unknown dark matter and dark energy in the cosmos. Okay, that was a lot. There's a lot of info right here. So what 
this is talking about is, I mean, this didn't really tell me much of anything. I could look at the citations. Um, but it looks like this guy has proposed some idea that maybe some sort of I concept of negative mass is contributing to dark matter or dark energy. Now, dark matter, dark matter is cool and weird. Um, dark matter and dark energy are, well, we don't know what they are. That's why we call them dark. We can't see them. We can't detect them. They don't interact with any, um, anything around us except through gravity. And that's how we know that they're there. We know dark matter. There is something that exists in galaxies, in, in the cosmos. And we call it dark matter because we can't see it, but we can observe what it does gravitationally. Um, dark matter, I'm pretty sure the confirmation of dark matter came from observing observing the angular momentum of galaxies and something wasn't adding up with the mass and the size of these galaxies that we could see their angular momentum was wrong like they they had too much angular momentum for how much stuff was in them and so this is one of the the drivers behind this idea of dark matter is that there is more stuff in that galaxy that has some sort of mass or at least interacts with gravity as a force that we can't see but it affects the shape and size and angular momentum of these galaxies and that that's dark matter there's been a bunch of stuff on, like, maybe they're, like, weakly interacting fundamental particles. I don't know. I haven't looked into dark matter in a long time because it's kind of, I don't know. Can't see it. Can't touch it. Can't really do anything. I mean, that's just cosmology for you. Your only data is light. So anyway, so there's some ideas about negative mass in cosmology. Okay, so in, in GR, general relativity, let's talk about relativity. So negative mass is any region of space for in which for some observers the mass density is measured to be negative. Okay, well, okay. Negative when it's negative. Um, this could occur due to a region of space where the stress component of the Einstein stress energy tensor is larger in magnitude than the mass density. All of these are violations of one or another variant of the positive energy condition of Einstein's theory of relativity. However, the positive energy condition is not a required condition for the mathematical consistency of the theory. Okay, so they're saying... If you have an area of space that basically the stress, the stress component of the stress energy tensor, I don't want to talk about the stress energy tensor. Um, is that you you have more. You have more stress? Oh, hi. Hello, um, mouthful of moths. My name's Maggie, and this is Physics University. I and the other people who run this channel are physics educators who want people to like physics more and it to be a more comfortable and inclusive environment. And so right now, I'm just 
reading about negative mass because it sounded fun to think about and I haven't thought about it in a long time. Um, but if you're interested in a topic, we could talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'm a, I'm a particle physicist by training and now an educational researcher. Oh, cool. He serves. Yay. I like it. I like physics. I like it when it's less in an academic context because sometimes academia is hard and not hard in a good way. What kind of, uh, what kind of physics are you studying? Is it like an intro college course? Is it like, are you doing Newton's laws? That's always fun stuff. I don't want to talk about stress energy tons. Never talk about tensors if you have the choice. Tensors are gross. Um, we will talk. I'm kind of grumpy. I'm supposed to have mods. And I never get mod. I mod when it's my turn to mod for the other two goofballs who help run this channel. I do my my mod time and they don't. Okay, so inertial mass versus gravitational mass. This is I don't know. We'll see what Wikipedia says. Um, in considering negative mass, it's important to consider which concepts of mass are negative. Okay, so this is this is always important whenever you're doing any sort of physics or math problem or making a model. When you attribute sign to something, what are you attributing the sign to? If it's a vector, then sign's going to mean something is a negative means direction. Um, if it's like an intrinsic property like a charge, then negative is assigning information, like an intrinsic quantity. Uh, negative signs are really tricky. I've actually read a bunch of papers, a bunch of educational research papers about how tricky negative signs can be because they mean so many different things in different contexts. So in this idea of thinking about a negative mass, we are, we need to think about what about the mass is negative. What does it, what does this negative mean? Is it a negative direction like a vector? Mass isn't a vector. Do I need Julie? No, I don't. What is that? Is that a person? Is that Oh, oh, it's a town. Oh, okay. It's a town in Germany. No, I don't. I don't know of this town. The uh the Wikipedia page has a really pretty building on it. Is that where you're from? I wish I wasn't in the state and was somewhere a little bit nicer right now. Oh, 
Oh, sweet. That's a pretty big university. What are you studying? I'm, uh, I'm not very smart, and I chose to go to graduate school for physics. Smart people don't go to graduate school, and extra smart people don't go to graduate school in physics. But. <laughs> the cool particle accelerator. There's a lot of cool particle accelerators. I've worked on a... I haven't worked on the actual particle accelerators, but I have worked on different experiments that have used particle accelerators. Um, let's see, I worked on... I did some work at Fermi lab with, but I didn't work on the accelerator there. Um, I worked with Beam at CERN for a while. Um, I was working on the Proto Dune experiment, so it was the prototype for a neutrino experiment, and we got, we were very very down beam line. We got like the leftovers of everyone else's experiments because we, I mean, neutrinos don't need as much. They're not as high energy or as cool as like proton proton collisions or something, but um, it was very fun to, it was simultaneously fun and also not very fun to run the control room for the, the experiment. Because, like, outside was this beautiful, gorgeous, pastoral French countryside. And I would bike past, like, these cows with bells on their neck. And it was very beautiful. And then I'd, like, get to CERN. And it's just kind of dumpy. You just go in these office buildings or a warehouse. And I just sat there in front of computers all day while, like, Beautiful France and Switzerland are just right outside. So I did that 16 hours a day for like a couple weeks. And then I had to go home. That was my trip to Europe. Uh, but, but it was cool. And I think that experiment, the actual, the non-prototype is getting, getting along okay. I don't know. I don't work on it. Um. I don't work on it anymore. I did. Did. I did like data verification, which was weird. I made sure that all of the. I was making sure that all of the. Little readout channels were signaling properly and. Writing. Writing software that would let the person on shift know if any of like our wires went down i'm not a software engineer but that's what i did wait what time is it if you're in germany because it's like 6 p.m 6 it's almost 7 p.m. where I am, which is not very late for me. I have a very bad sleep schedule. Oh, I need more. I shouldn't be drinking coffee at 7 o'clock at night, but, you know, that's the life of an academic. Okay, so here they're talking about inertial mass being the M that appears in Newton's laws of motion, active gravitational mass being a mass that produces a gravitational field, 
and passive gravitational mass, the mass that responds to a gravitational field by accelerating. Okay, that's interesting that they, that's good language. I might actually steal that language for when I teach electrostatics or gravity. So I don't, I don't think mass can be negative. I don't know. So in here, it seems um, most of the conceptions, actually, let me just scroll down. Okay. So most of the conceptions I've seen about negative mass as a topic are saying like <sighs> positive, if I had electric charges, a positive electric charge and a negative electric charge are going to attract each other. Opposites attract and like charges repel each other. And those forces, electric forces, behave like one over R squared. Gravity also behaves like one over R squared. And I need two gravitational things, two masses, to have a gravitational force. The gravitational force law of G mass one, mass two over R squared looks a lot like the electric force law, which is a constant, we'll call it K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And we have negative and positive electric charge, but we only have positive mass. We only have attractive mass. Mass is always positive and it's always attracting other mass. And so for funsies, people have wondered what would happen if, like electricity, we had a different like sign, a different charge of mass. If we have positive mass that attracts positive mass, what would negative mass do? Would it repel positive mass? Would it attract other negative masses? Would it repel other negative masses? And so this is just like a thought thing. Um, as far as I know, there is no experimental anything that has confirmed any ideas about negative mass. It's just kind of a fun thought experiment. It's it's a way to explore your model and I don't know. It's just it's just fun. It's a fun what if. And so here actually do I want to read there was a paper. I think I might want to read this paper. We'll open that up in another tab. So this was an essay yeah, exactly. Exactly like quark flavors. Right. So like quarks have some intrinsic property about them. They can be red or green or blue. They're not actually those colors. There's just a name we give them because they have some sort of three-way intrinsic property. And mass is some sort of intrinsic property, but it's like a, there's only one type of mass charge. There's only one type of flavor. Um, oh, sorry. I was thinking about color charge. You're talking about flavors like up and down and charm and strange and top and bottom. Yeah. Like all of these intrinsic properties interact with each other or they're conserved in some way. Um, like electric charge is conserved and lepton line is conserved or quark, certain quark flavors are conserved um, and mass is conserved. But like, what does it look like if we had more than just one flavor of mass? Um, so this guy wrote a paper on how negative mass would behave under gravity and other forces. I think I just want to go read that paper. I think it'll be interesting. Um, but the big... The big thing is 
that makes negative mass kind of fun as a concept is this idea of runaway motion. And it's it's not physical, but this is the concept behind a lot of like theoretical warp drives or time travel is negative mass using it to move you through space time um so traditionally we've got positive mass attracted to positive mass and so uh although no no particles are known to have negative mass these folks have been able to describe anticipated properties of negative mass so doesn't exist okay assuming that all three concepts of mass are equivalent according to the equivalence principle and that gravitational interactions between masses of arbitrary sign can be explored um based on the newtonian approximation of the field equations the interaction laws are then okay so these folks went through and they looked at what mass can do and they looked at being inertial, creating a gravitational field, or interacting with a gravitational field. Yeah, we could think about what would electricity look like if it had, um, like, a three-way charge. And, I mean, that's kind of one of the, the big mysteries in magnetism, is the fact that there's not there's no such thing as like a magnetic monopole. There's not a single magnetic charge. It always comes in a north and south. It's always a magnetic dipole. And like the monopole doesn't exist. And people have tried. People have really tried to find the magnetic monopole. And it does not. It's not a thing. I remember in my grad E&M course, the professor spent all this time talking about the solitary magnetic charge and how it, it wasn't real and we had to like derive all this stuff about why it wasn't real i i'm a quantum person i like not electromagnetism and all that vector calculus but yeah I hate that we call it positive charge and negative charge. I think it's a disservice. And I think it's a disservice because of that. Because of the fact that negatives can mean so many different things. Like I love, I love um, pork flavors and I love like color charge because it's like, it's its own thing. I'm going to name this charm and strange because it it is some intrinsic property that is just so it's a different thing. But I mean, we could have I guess we could have called charges that. We could have had like electric happy and electric sad or something made up some new There's just too many negative signs everywhere. Positive and negative. Could you have a three-way cyclic charge? I feel like you could have a four. Sorry, and now I'm thinking about um, imaginary numbers and then quaternions and then octonions being different cyclic number systems. probably not useful um so positive mass attracts other positive masses and it attracts negative mass okay so everything wants to go towards positive mass positive and negative negative mass repels negative masses and it repels positive mass okay this 
You know what? Let's. This kind of makes sense to me. So, I'm thinking, thinking, we have, have some sort of gravitational potential landscape. Like, I don't know, maybe there's a big mass here got low potential, I've got high potential. A regular mass. Oh! The tablet fairy is here with my tablet. Thank you. Tablet fairy. Hmm. So, if I had positive mass going to be attracted or like rolled down a potential and I've got I've got some some point mass and then negative mass we'll make we'll make negative mass a different get spooky lava color Negative mass also goes downhill, but then repels. It like creates spikes. Yeah, I have a mod now. So like this guy is gonna create his own positive. Okay, so it's it's like negative masses would create potentials that look like positive charges like spikes this looks like garbage let's 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 let me redraw this so if i've got some sort of position versus potential plot and i have a Call this guy negative mass. He's going to create some sort of potential that looks like a GM over R, but negative? Wait. Oh, it's negative GMM over R, and then this guy is. I can't write. This guy is negative. Okay, and then if I had, we'll swap color. If I have positive mass, then this is gonna look like negative G M over R. So I'm gonna get some sort of plot that looks like I mean, these are so. If I put a regular any, I'm trying to understand what this statement is. Like. So, positive mass attracts positive and negative mass. Negative mass repels. Okay, so what they're saying is that unlike electric charges. If these, if this was like a positive charge and a negative charge, negative charges roll uphill is how I remember it. Like negative, negative charges want to be at high potential because that is low energy for them. And positive charges want to be at low potential, which is low energy for them. But here, any sort of mass is going to want any sort of mass is going to want to go down hill. Downhill is low energy for all masses in this weird 
ass model. I don't know how it makes sense. Well, I don't know. I'm just reading the Wikipedia page. This is what Wikipedia is telling me. Well, I think that's so. The yeah, this is this is the conundrum, right? Is that in electromagnetism you have like charges repel each other, but in here we know that positive mass attracts positive mass, and so like charges do not always repel. Um, it's that all all masses. Uh, where's my all masses? regardless of sign, want to go to low potential. But that means if this thing, if, if this little fella right here wants to go to low potential, it's going to move towards the positive masses, which is going to cause the positive mass to see a slope. It'll see a slope next to it. The slope is... Uh, a slope of potential is the force, so it's going to feel a force and it's going to start moving away. And then this, this fellow is going to say, hey, wait, no, I want you even more. And they're just going to run away with each other, which is the Alcubierre drive. We put both types of mass in one place. I mean, we could add them as functions and we would get no gravitational potential. I feel like that would be an unstable equilibria. Yeah, one of them wants to move away and one of them wants to move towards. So if I had, if we had a, a positive, we have a negative mass and we have a positive mass that are in the same spot. This actually, yeah, let's just draw. Let's do all, let's do, okay. Here's my positive mass and it feels a repulsive force from, um, how do I want to denote this? It feels a force to the side from yeah it's not it's not stable at all Be because this one's going to feel a force that way um and then this thing if i drew a free body diagram is going to feel a force that way on. yeah if they're already stay on, on they'll, they'll stay on top of each other but they'll like move together They'll, they'll move to the side. They'll move in some direction. Positive charge. They're attached. Negative charge. If you're going to talk, you got to get closer to the mic. I have a peanut gallery. So you can get in chat. You could peanut gallery in chat, or you can... I'm going to... Uh, yeah, okay. So, I guess, yeah, we could think about it as like a, a dipole. And my gravitational, then I'd be thinking about like gravitational field lines? Oh, I don't like this. This makes me uncomfortable. I don't know. A gravity well, so I think a, a gravity well would look the same. I mean, if we go, if we run, huh, if we run with this idea of runaway motion, where the mass is going to run away from negative mass and negative mass wants to chase positive mass, um, it would... It would mean that all negative mass is being pushed to the negative mass wants to repel other negative mass.
So it, would it be just like pushed to the edge of the universe? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. Theoretical things like this are very weird. Yes. Yeah, okay. So my peanut gallery just brought up that the problem wait, come back. Okay, the problem comes from this if I were to So we have F equals M A and these are both vectors and this is getting at what I was talking about earlier where negative signs can denote a lot of different things. If I have a negative vector quantity, it means that it is a vector pointing in a different direction. But if I have a negative thing like a mass or I have a negative charge, that, that's an intrinsic property. And so the negative sign is connoting something different based on what sort of mathematical beast the negative sign belongs to. So if we had, I mean, let's think about a mass got a point mass and there's another point mass. I have two point masses. This one is little m and this one will be big M. Traditionally, um, if I were to draw a free body diagram, this is going to feel a force to the left, to the right. I don't my know my directions. And it is going to be a force equal to its mass times its acceleration. And this mass is going to feel a force. And this is going to be a force pair that is equal to F, um, I'm going to say, of M on big M. No, yeah on little m from big M, and this is going to be on big M from little m, and is going to equal big M A, and these forces should be equal and opposite. So I should have um, big M on little m should equal negative little m on big M. So equal and opposite forces Yeah, yes, I know. Peanut gallery. No, I need a mod. Okay, go mod from the other room. Don't live in a house full of physicists. It's a bad idea. Um, And the form of these forces looks like... Um, I'm just going to say, let's talk about the absolute value. Let's just talk about the magnitude of the force. Magnitude. The magnitude of these forces looks like gravitational constant, the product of the masses divided by the distance between them squared. And that's the magnitude. The actual force is going to be GMM over R squared in the R hat direction. So okay, so in our our little toy model of two point masses, this thing and this thing, the, the force pair are opposite in sign because of the direction. Because R hat for this guy points to the right and R hat for this particle points to the left. So this is like in the positive direction, and then this one would be in the negative direction. And that's where this negative sign comes from. Because they're on opposite sides of each other. And so what happens then, 
me get a color that is maybe a little bit better. Let's do blue. If one of these things becomes negative, if this mass is negative, then this becomes negative M. Okay, this is, yeah, this is where the problems come from. Because the magnitude of the force should stay the same. Oh, does it? I think it does. The magnitude of the force stays the same. But the direction now changes. This changes the direction. What? See, this is why I wanted to talk about negative mass, because it's weird. It's not real, and it's weird. So I have negative m, m over r squared, and then r hat is pointing in the same direction. And then over here, doo -doo 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 -doo. my work is also really garbage looking. Negative m, m. This is the plus r hat side. This is the negative r hat side. r hat over r squared. This is telling me that they are both, well, this is telling me that it's attractive. So I get two, what am I doing wrong? Dude, let's just go read the paper. I wanted to read it. I'm gonna read it. Uh, on negative mass in the future. Let's just read this thing. That's ugly. Okay. Oh my god, this old paper is real. I don't know. I don't know if a negative mass can just cancel out a negative factor. I mean, in in electromagnetism, the idea that a negative like a negative charge a negative charge and a positive charge, like the negative, the difference in sign. The difference in sign is what causes a direction, like will change the, the direction of the vector. And so I think that in this case, it doesn't, or it does. Everything goes towards positive mass. So if I have, if I've got my positive mass here, and I have my test mass. We'll call it, we'll call our test mass something different. Let's not call it M. Let's call it, I don't have enough letters. Let's call it mu. So if mu is positive, it's going to feel a force equal, is it negative? Negative GMM over R? over r squared in the r hat direction and this negative is implying that it's an attractive force but then also the force would look like mu a which would look like mu negative g m over r squared in the r hat direction. And so if mu is negative, 
and this is negative this is negative and then this is negative but then it's still attractive or it's sorry it's repulsive here force looks the force looks repulsive oh acceleration the force is repulsive but the acceleration is attractive that's very uncomfortable and i don't like that this is weird so all is gauss's law say if right, like if I put a positive and a negative mass on top of one another, it seems to me like it's going to look like it's flat space, not anything. Yeah. Right? So at the very least, so you're saying you're... that's fine. I, and I think your, your statement, Moth, is a mouthful. Um, it's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. I of think, Moths. I think your, your idea here that can I put a positive mass on top of a negative mass, see nothing. It cancel each other. I think that's true. I think that's true. I, I, I think your statement's true. I, I think it will work out like that, and it will still work like charge. The problem is, if you separate them by any amount of distance, they are going to chase one another and continue to accelerate away and towards one another and just print energy. So. That'd be nice. Yeah. So, the... So having having a positive and negative mass anywhere near one another will just infinitely print energy, which is just like maybe that's how the universe is. Or yeah. Or maybe <laughs> I'm just making shit up. Um. Well, so you mentioning Gauss's law made me think of like drawing field lines. So the gravitational field lines for a mass are going to point towards the mass. For a positive mass, I'm going to have gravitational field lines in, which means for a negative mass, I'd have gravitational field lines out. And I think what the model is saying is that any charge, any charge is going to travel along field lines, regardless of whether it's positive or negative. Negative charges want to travel along field lines. Positive masses want to travel along field lines as well. And so if that's a way better way of thinking about it, this fella is going to run away from these field lines and this fella is going to run down his neighbor's field. Line. Yeah. Bren Brendan's thinking about the next step and he doesn't like it. Like quarks opposite say more like how quarks are attracted to other quarks via strong force <sighs> like do i now i'm just thinking about like gravitational field flux because you kept you said gauss So here, Brendan, come look at this. This is like the, oh, never mind. He's halfway through figuring something out. Um, what is this paper though? The mass of a particle is determined by the constant of integration. Ooh, I actually do want to read this. Yeah, I think. It could be similar to how, but the analog there is that quarks aren't repulsed from other quarks via the strong force. All, all masses. All masses follow field lines. I think that's a much better way to think about it. Even, I mean, it's similar. It's similar to this idea that. The lowest energy configuration for any mass, be it a positive mass or a negative mass, would be low potential. So it's going to go downhill. It's going to follow the field lines. It's going to follow the negative gradient. 
of any potential. <sighs> See, this is why I thought this was an interesting topic, and it's weird and it's bananas. Yeah, I don't think it's a stable state. I don't think that you can have any configuration. Well, and of course, like, actually, it kind of makes sense that this would not be... Even if you had a negative and a positive mass in the same location, that they would, it would not be a stable equilibrium position at all. Extra. Because we, I mean, we don't observe it. We don't see negative mass anywhere. So clearly, like, if it exists, it has been flung somewhere else. There's also this additional problem I just thought of, which is that, like, if I have my two, my positive and negative mass, near, I have my dipole. <laughs> So we've got a positive mass. They're separated by some distance d. And a negative mass. And they're separated by a distance d. It's going to get into a tiny bit of relativity. It's mass. Of course, we're going to talk about relativity. Um, not g just like SR. I guess it's Galilean for the time being. So like, let's say I nudge my, I nudge my negative mass by a little bit. Okay. So I, I move it a little bit. So now we have negative mass here and it's shifted so, some for the small amount of time interval that it takes to shift that thing or for some small amount of time interval before this charge or this mass notices sorry the, the positive mass notice that the left that the negative mass move that negative mass is going to have a slightly smaller acceleration because it's slightly farther away it's going to have a smaller acceleration towards the positive mass because it's farther away? Yeah. Sure, sure. It's going to feel less of a force because it's farther away. I, I'll buy that. Do I not get a rubber banding effect? Or do I not get a snowball effect from that? In that uh, if you pull it away farther and farther, it'll feel no, less no, no. and less force? I don't touch it again, but there's a time delay now because it takes time for the force to propagate. Right? Like it, it, in, in, in Conian, like th something has to tell it that that happened, right? So it takes time for yes. that information that the negative mass has moved to show up to the positive mass. Yes. Do I not have a, have, have a runaway effect from that? Because I, I, can, I, can I can just build on that. How do you That's do this, though? How do you... Induction. No, sorry, not the, not the moving... Like the... Sorry, I wasn't answering that question with the I was saying. How do you, this is, an this, is an this is a mathematical induction thing. Sure, fine, I'll buy that. How do you, you can't move this mass. You can't move the negative mass or a positive mass without, oh, thank you for the follow, mouthful of magpies. Well, Brendan and I are just arguing with each other about <laughs> the, the finer points of made up mass scenarios. If you move it, you're introducing energy. Like you're, you're, you, you have to be putting at work into the system to do this. So like you can't. Hey, that's my bedtime usually too. I don't go to bed until 4 a.m. my time. But thanks for stopping by. And we have a YouTube channel where we'll post VODs. We've got, we've got a couple VODs up there. But I loved having you around and love talking. Thanks for giving me thoughts to think about. Why did I pick this topic? I picked this topic because I wanted to make my brain hurt. <laughs> this regime of anything to look at ever. You're the one who did this, though. No, no, no. I think this is, this is a problem. This is a problem. <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> this implies that there are no, like, temporally no. stable configurations to perturbate. There are no temporally like, stable configurations to anything. Time is always moving. No, but, but I mean, like, but I mean, like, I'm clearly not stable. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was so. This is the paper that I was super interested in, right? So this is this was an essay that won like fourth place in an essay contest in the '50s, and it's called "On Negative Mass in the Theory of Gravitation," and like. 
I just am in awe at how, like, they didn't have things typeset in the 50s. And so, like, he draws it in. You gotta draw on top of it. I love it. I love it. This is so cute and makes me happy. Okay. Well, I'm gonna read this paper. I'm gonna read this paper, and we'll probably end stream after that. But, okay. Purpose of this brief note is a critical survey on the idea of negative mass. Negative, quote unquote, in the theory of gravitation. Uh, in reading Richard Farrell's prize winning essay, The Possibility of New Gravitational Effects, I found basic confusion as to how such a negative mass would behave. And since subsequent discussions have convinced me that this confusion is widespread, I've taken this opportunity to attempt to clarify the issue. A couple comments I want to make. I love... One, I, I love just like how raw and typeset and scanned with little punch holes this paper is. It tickles me. I also love how the author, because they are a sole author, chose to use I. I hate it when single authors use we. You're not a king. All right. Um, purpose of this brief note. Okay. Uh, the role which mass plays in the general theory of relativity is quite different from the mass of ordinary Newtonian mechanics and gravitation. Yes, that is true. It will be remembered that the true starting point of general relativity was noticing the equivalence of inertial mass, that is, the mass occurring in Newton's law of motion F equals ma, and gravitational mass, that is, the mass occurring in Newton's law of gravitation, F equals negative GMM over R squared. Okay, so this is like how, how much you accelerate based on a force on you versus gravitational fields. Relativity is the reconciling of those two things as the same, the mass in both is the same mass. It's not like I've got, it's not that inertial mass and gravitational mass are different things. They're, they're the same thing. The fa this fact is, so to speak, built into the general theory of relativity. The result is that in discussing the motion of a mass point in general relativity, the mass of, a part, uh, the, mass of the particle never appears. That is true. Because in general relativity, you are looking at curves, you're looking at the differential geometry of space-time. And so the, the point that is traversing space-time, like it doesn't matter what its mass is, um, never appears. In the Newtonian case, on the other hand, the mass of the particle appeared on both sides of the equation and then canceled out due to the apparent fortuitousness equality of inertial and gravitational masses. One can then ask... Oh, no, it's my sweater. Fuzzy sweater. Um, uh, canceled out due to the fortuitous equality of inertial and gravitational masses. One can then ask, in view of this, how does mass enter into the general theory of relativity at all? So in this idea of like being more than just a curve in the differential geometry. Um, it's on the heat. It's very toasty in here. The answer is that it enters in when we wish to discuss the field produced by an isolated material point. Spoken like a true physicist. It exists when we want it to. This solution of the partial differential equation of the gravitational field was first obtained approximately by Einstein and later exactly by Schwarzschild. Okay. The solution contains two arbitrary constants of integration. One is usually eliminated by requiring the gravitational field to be zero at infinity. Okay. Yep. If we integrate the gravitational field, we are expecting like zero potential or flat space out at infinity away from any sort of like gravitational mass. Um, the other is obtained by the requirement 
that sufficiently far away, i.e. when the gravitational field is weak enough, we must once more have Newton's laws of gravitation. Okay, so both are, both are kind of an infinity condition. This enables us to determine the constant of integration in terms of the mass of the particular, of the particle giving use to the field. Equivalently, we may say that the mass of the particle is determined by the constant of integration. Okay. Okay. Now, this is very striking because this constant of integration is in principle completely arbitrary and therefore the resulting mass is completely arbitrary. Any positive or negative number whatsoever. Okay, so this is coming from... If I, you know, if I integrate and I have some sort of arbitrary integral or I'm going to, I'm going to have a constant that pops in when I integrate. And this is saying that one of those constants is representative of the mass that's interacting with the gravitational field. And from a mathematical perspective, that that number could be anything. In other words, general relativity does not prohibit the existence of a negative mass. Even though such masses have never been observed, up till now, we agree with the statements of Farrell. It is the interpretation of what this negative mass means that we find a different result. We assert the following. A positive mass does not necessarily repel a mass which is negative. The reason for this is as follows. The principle of equivalence in general relativity requires that the inertial mass equal to the gravitational mass. Okay, yep, I'm good with that. If we take a particle with a negative gravitational mass, then we must also take its inertial mass to be negative. That's, okay, that's what we were talking about earlier, about, like, if it's attracted to, like, which way does it accelerate based on the field line? Okay. If we take a particle, wait, so does that mean if I push on a negative mass, it feels a pull? Because its inertial mass is negative? and it will accelerate in the direction opposite of the force. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on, I hadn't even thought about that. <sighs> okay. Sorry, I need a second. Okay, moving on. Um, if we take a particle with negative gravitational mass, then we must also take its inertial mass negative. A careful reading of Farrell's paper shows that he defines negative mass as a gravitational mass and inertial mass uh, gravitational mass and inertial mass equal and opposite, a definition which is impossible according to general theory of relativity. Okay, so the guy who he's citing did something similar but didn't allow for negative inertial mass. As an example, let us study in some detail the actual motion of two particles, one of which has mass m and the other has negative m. Let us start from rest and let their positions lie along the line uh, joining them be given by x1 and x2 respectively. Okay, so mass 1 is at x1 and mass negative is at x2. If we are not interested in the extremely small corrections, sure, we may use Newton's laws of motion. These are for our case all right so we've got for our mass its second derivative of position with respect to time so its acceleration should be equal to gmm mass negative mass over 
the distance between the two. So x2 minus or x1 minus x2 absolute value squared. I'm okay with that. And then here, make this big so you can just like look at the beauty of this wacky little paper. Um, and then this, the negative mass has its second derivative of position, its acceleration equal to uh, negative y. Why is this one? I, why do I have another negative sign? In oh, because of the position. Okay. Okay. So I was confused about this negative sign. Again, negative signs can mean a million different things. Uh, but what it is talking about is that mass, this, this is oriented to the, the right, like along the positive x direction or here. And this is negatively directed because they have absolute values on the, the r. And think that's where that, that this negative sign is coming from. Okay, where the gravitation Jesus gravitational constant simplifying both, we get ba -ba. ah, so we get that the acceleration, the the change in x one is equal to this, and the change in x two is also equal to this. So they have identical acceleration. Interesting. Now, if we subtract the first of these equations and the second, yep, we subtract them, we get that the difference in the accelerations is zero. This equation may be integrated at once and yields that the difference between, uh, the difference between the positions is a plus bt, where a and b are the constants of integration, to be fixed by the initial positions and velocities of the two particles. Yep, so... Our constants of integration come from our initial conditions. Since we assumed the initial velocities to be zero, we get b equals zero. Yep. And a will represent the initial distance the particles are apart. Okay. So we have x2 minus x1 equals a. Bingo bongo. Uh, that is the distance between the particles remains constant. There is no trace of repulsion. Now, this result may be substituted back into our original equations, and we get, okay, so they're just replacing x2 minus x1 with a. They showed that the accelerations of the two particles will be equal, meaning my mass and my negative mass, no matter how they move, are going to have a constant distance between them. So even if they do move, they're always going to be the same distance apart. Meaning that we know, we know that this distance here is a constant, and we can keep it as a constant. There, uh, so they replace that back in. Therefore, the position of the first one, okay, so they just did some rearranging and integrating. Uh, GM over 2, A squared, T squared. This is just kind of a kinematics-y looking equation. We can describe the motion as follows. The particles will remain at a fixed distance from another, but the whole system accelerates uniformly to the left with a constant acceleration of gm over a squared. Okay, so this is... I think this is exactly what Brendan was trying to talk about with a dipole, where you like look at the, the, the center of charge as being like constantly moving. Maybe it's not. I don't know. He's gone again. Thus, we can see that for two masses starting from rest, one negative and the other positive, there is no repulsion at all between them, but only rather a, the queer motion described above. The result of Faro would be obtained if one used the equations of motion star. So here, they don't have that negative sign.
Okay, so if we do it the other way where we don't we don't use that directional, I think that directional sign, then we get that their accelerations are the same, but we don't have we get that the sum of the accelerations is zero. Oh, this means that the center of gravity stays fixed as described by Farrell. Similar to the treatment given for the correct equation, one can easily show that these equations do give a repulsion between particles. So this one is saying that the center, the center of mass stays fixed, but the two particles will move away from each other. Um, as pointed out above, however, these equations are in contradiction with the most basic principle of relativity's principle of equivalence. Okay, so if we, uh, okay, yep. So if we don't treat here, instead if we don't treat gravitational mass and inertial mass as the same thing, if we always say inertial mass is positive, even if the gravitational mass is negative, you got to switch it. In view of this result, we can ask if we have to abandon hope for the possibility of a gravitational shield, even if negative mass should be discovered in nature. The answer is no, if negative mass is larger than the mass we wish to repel. To see this, let us go back to our old example. But now let's make the masses different. Let the positive mass be m as before and the negative mass be negative big M. Oh, yeah, I was wondering why there was an asterisk. Okay. So the asterisk is, it is perhaps not without interest to note that these same equations would be obtained for the interaction of two negative masses. Thus, two negative masses would repel each other in general relativity. Okay, so this is that idea that the negative mass is going to run away from a negative mass because of wanting to follow field, like gravitational field lines, which go away from negative masses. Uh, okay, so equations of motion are this, but we've got a big, we've got a heck and chonker of a negative mass. If we subtract the first, now, yep, we got the distance between the particles. Um, x2 minus x1 is just the distance between the particles. Let's call it r. Then the differential equation becomes uh, d squared r dt squared. So the acceleration of r very well in differential equation. We shall not describe its integration here. Do it for yourself. The result of the integration is this. Yeah, okay, so I integrate once. What did they do? I mean, you get a one over, okay, whatever. I'll trust that they integrated correctly. So we get the velocity squared is equal to this. The particles are initially at rest and separated by a distance r. So initially at rest, their velocity is zero. Separated by distance r, then zero, we can solve. Okay, so they're solving for the initial condition C, where C is 2G, the difference in the magnitudes of the masses over R. So however much bigger in size but not sign. And moving on. Since dr dt squared is always greater than zero, mm, I would say it's always zero or greater, but 
Okay, so they solved for C, they threw it back in, and then rearranged. They rearranged this with their initial condition of C in. The right hand side of this equation is always the right hand side of this equation must always be bigger than zero. We have three cases to consider. Okay, so in order for this chunk to be I mean, I kinda wanna I kinda wanna do this on my own. I kinda wanna have fun on my own. Let's go. Let me write this down. Okay. So we have I'll use a color that's parsable. I'll use a color that's parsable and I'll use so we have I did it again. R. We've got dr dt squared equals 2g m minus m 1 over r minus 1 over little r. Okay. So we need to consider we need to consider the different cases of this. Eight one note. Okay, so we have case. And this has to be bigger or equal to zero. So we have M has to be bigger than M. We have that. 1 over r has to be bigger than 1 over r. Or that r must be smaller than r. And the third condition is the opposite one where little m little m's bigger and little r is bigger so what do these three conditions mean one of them means that my negative mass has to be bigger, has to be bigger than my small mass. Or, or is that and? These two might be the same condition. Um, to keep the whole thing positive, yeah. So to, uh, and they need to start, they need to start farther away than some critical capital R. If those two things are true, then we get a velocity. We get a repulsive, we get that they move away. Yeah, that the distance between them increases. Or if they are, the sign, the sizes are swapped. I need this guy to be bigger than this guy. That means then that they need to be I wrote the same thing twice. They need to be um, in a different region of space. I don't know if that made any sense. Let's see what he says. Uh, 
M is greater than little m, then R must be greater than big R. And we see that they have repulsion since the distance tends to increase. Okay, yep, that's what I said. If M is less than little m, then R must be, so we have to be within a critical distance and we see that there is attraction. Actually, a more careful investigation shows that the attraction lasts until the particles pass through one another, if they can, and then is replaced by repulsion. I want to look at that closer. And then we have M equal to M. As discase, discussed previously, there is neither attraction or... Wait, 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 wait. Let's go back. Let's go back. I want to look at this. Okay. So we have M is bigger than M. We said... This quantity is positive, then this quantity also needs to be positive. Oh, that's why they said it's bigger than zero, because it's squared. I didn't see that. Uh, and One. Oh, and R is smaller than R. So this is saying that with, yeah, if the negative mass is larger, then we'll get a repulsive force. Then, then this is going to increase. If the negative mass is larger, we will get a repulsive force. If the negative mass is larger and R, we are outside this critical region. And then the other version is we are, the masses are swapped and we are inside the critical region. Then it will be attractive. This is really weird. A large negative mass could act as a neutralizer of gravitation, but the size of the negative mass necessarily depends on the mass of the object one wants to be free wants to be free from its gravitational bonds. Oh, and that's it. That's the end. Okay. Interesting. Okay, um, two objects of equal and opposite mass would produce constant acceleration of the system towards the positive mass object. The effect called runaway motion is disregarded by saying runaway motion is so preposterous that I prefer to rule it out by supposing that inertial mass is all positive or all negative. Interesting. Well, Brendan will be delighted to see that they talk about Gauss's law of gravitation. <laughs> Assuming that the curl is zero. Yep. Negative energy density for gravitational bonds. Matter. One can achieve negative mass independent of negative. That's kind of cool. My brain hurts. Oh, no, I don't want to talk about metamaterials. Oh, look. And <laughs> mostly just because my brain hurts and I want to not think about hurty things. I need a week to recoup. And then we'll talk about something weird again. Um, But thank you for tuning in if you are a VOD watcher. This has been Maggie looking at nonsensical theoretical ideas of negative mass for Physics University. Anyway, thanks for hanging out and stay safe. I'll catch you next time.